Here we go. Thank you very much for wel- for joining us here at the Rutherford Sports Network podcast. And we have a unique feature today. We're actually talking to somebody, doing an interview with none other than my old classmate from East Rutherford High School and good friend Tammy Messine. She is the owner of Refuse to Lose Coaching, LLC. She has authored several books. Uh, she's a mental skills coach and assists people in all walks of life, not just athletes. She has authored the book, her recent book, called uh, This Is Good, A Journey on Overcoming Adversity. It's recently come out, and um, she has also authored a previous book, The Confident Athlete, Four Easy Easy Steps to Build and Maintain Confidence, and she is joining us today. Hello, Tammy. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, John. Thanks for having me. Okay, well, I'm sure you've probably heard this topic before. We're in very unprecedented times right now with the coronavirus and basically the entire sports scene pretty much stopped right now, not just for the pro sports athletes, although they're about to start getting back into, uh, and if if you follow soccer, they've actually been back for about a month now. But college and high school athletics have been pretty much shut completely down. We're not even sure if we're going to have any in the fall yet there's some speculation there may be some how have the clients that you've been talking to dealt with this crisis and how they've been able to keep their routines going and how they keep it how how they how they've been keeping their motivation going during this very difficult time you know it's varied with every team and athlete that i've worked with um the biggest challenge like you say is is keeping that motivation and the unknown because we don't know and Mm -hmm. so you're trying to keep your athletes physically and mentally ready at any moment's notice but yet no one has the answers Um, what I am seeing is the coaches and athletes that look at this as an opportunity Mm -hmm. and I'm using this time to better myself and strengthen myself are going to be the ones that I honestly believe are going to set themselves apart when we do get to return the ones that are feeling sorry for themselves, poor mm-hmm. me, my sports yeah. been taken away, mm-hmm. you know, I've lost my identity and just kind of become that, you know, couch potato, mm-hmm. um, are going to be the ones that fall behind. So despite mm-hmm. the challenges, I think this is a great opportunity in the long run. Well, I, I, that's, that's definitely true about uh, a lot of people that have taken this um and just been the whole woe is me and all that. And some of us have taken it as a chance to go, okay, it sucks, but you know, we're, we got, you got to live and you got to move on. So I've done, gotten back into working up some of my writing and such. And speaking of that, uh, how you've authored several books and such, and how have you felt the writing process has helped you out on your confidence and, uh, when did you start getting into writing books for uh, for athletes yourself? Um, it's a long journey that actually goes back to high school, John. Um, mm-hmm. It was interesting. You know, as a student, I did pretty well in school, except mm-hmm. for anything involved writing. Um, <laughs> you know, I would... <laughs> That, that's the funny thing, you know, I would do book reports or, you know, our term papers that we had and mm-hmm. every, every, you know, teacher, great material, great research. And then uh, you struggled writing or, you know, C mm-hmm. on your grammar or, you know, whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. So I had convinced myself I couldn't write. Yeah. Um, I actually had a teacher and I won't, I won't mention the name, but gave me an F on a book report. And I had said I was going to spend so much time, I was going to show her, because, you know, that mm-hmm. that was everybody's mindset. Tammy was yeah. smart, but she couldn't write. Mm-hmm. So I said, I'm going to work hard, turn it in, get back an F, because she said it was too good to be mine. Mm-hmm. So it, it just fed into that mm-hmm. belief system of mine that I couldn't write. Yeah. So I started getting in the job I was doing, felt good standing up and talking in front of people, but then they would say, well, leave us something written that we can use when you're not here. Nope, mm-hmm. I don't write. Nope, <laughs> don't write. And it was just easier to say that. People were telling me, you need a blog to help with your business. Nope, mm-hmm. I don't write. And uh, <laughs> finally, I had a coach challenge me and said, uh, you tell us to step outside our comfort zones, but you're not really. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, ouch, okay. Um mm-hmm. 
So I went home and thought about it, had a lot of obstacles um, in, in doing it and working through my lack of confidence in writing. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the first book was mainly for me to have that confidence that I could do mm-hmm. it um, mm-hmm. and then help, help people along the way, obviously. Uh, so it was kind of like I cut that chain around my ankle that I was carrying. So that's kind of how it all started. And then it was like, oh, okay, this this did well. I can do another one. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's my story there. Okay. I, I understand that because I remember my, I, for the longest time, I just basically wrote little stories here or there and all that. And then after a very, very painful breakup, I went into something they call fan fiction, which is uh, basically, for those of you who may not know, it's basically writing stories off of TV shows and movies and whatnot, and I just did this as a bit personal challenge and got the confidence to write my first novel, which is Through the Hourglass, which you can find on Amazon and Kindle, uh, and I've been working on my second one, which has been a real challenge, because I've been... Nonfiction, which is basically what you do here, and fiction are very different in some ways. Some ways are not, so I can understand the challenges. It's difficult when you got a huge, gigantic fictional universe in your head trying to put it out and doing this. Um, now, obviously, I know you from high school. You were a t- very talented athlete. You moved on to Lenore Ryan, playing basketball and tennis. Um, what are the lessons you learned at Lenore Ryan that helped you out later in life? Um, in your professional career and such. And, um, Lenore Ryan, for those of you who may not know, is a small college, I believe, near Hickory, if I'm not mistaken. And, you right. uh, You know, because one time or another, they actually had a sports casting program I almost went into, and before I could actually go into it, they dropped it. <laughs> oh, no, I do remember they had that. You would yeah. have been great at that. Oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah. If, um, you, if you'd well, comment on that, to about that, your, about your... A collegiate career. <laughs> I, th- I think the biggest challenge, um, our biggest thing I learned was getting to know, know me. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you remember or not, but I originally started off at North Carolina, yeah. and I wasn't going to play sports. Mm-hmm. Um, that was due to various reasons, and I was told, you know, at that time it wasn't as popular for females to play in college, and mm-hmm. your job was to go, you know, get an education and, and marriage or something along those yeah. lines. And mm-hmm. After one semester at North Carolina, I realized that wasn't for me, mm-hmm. and so it took a lot of uh, a lot of talks and courage um, mm-hmm. for me to make the decision. No, I wasn't living out the dream that are the blueprints that a lot of people had for me and then there was some freedom in that now there were a lot of struggles with sports at LR our basketball team we had three different coaches when I was there Mm. and basically we nicknamed ourselves the bad news bear so (laughs) coming from (laughs) um, a successful high school program to Mm -hmm. winning you know I don't think we ever won double digits in a Mm. season there Um, that was very challenging and i probably did not handle that correctly the first year or two Mm -hmm. but I think as I matured I started learning the lessons you can learn from failure and more than any other skill I have I think that helps me with teams because I've been there I've done it I know how it feels to lose Mm -hmm. and trying to make the most of the situation and that it's not a life or death situation at all yeah uh, and then, of course, you moved on to get your master's degree in sports administration at, at North Carolina. Obviously, ironically enough, you did go back there. Uh, and then you started working at. Um, by the way, for, she is a fellow Tar Heel fan. I wanted to go there, but my grades Don't weren't the greatest. <laughs> um, then, um, then you became men's and women's tennis coach at USC Upstate, formerly known as USC Spartanburg. Um, for those of us who think the name should have stuck with the old one, but I'm, I digress. Um, how, how did you how did you do at a UNC's uh, not UNC USC Upstate's men's and women's tennis program? How did you find the challenge of uh, motivating young athletes there? Did you struggle at first with that, or did you feel like you found your niche r- right away in that? Um, I. Th- I think it was probably easier to motivate 
uh, to begin with. I, I took over a program that was rock bottom, mm-hmm. and everyone told me, oh, you don't want to do that. You, you'll never turn it around. Mm-hmm. And my athletic director challenged me. We were Division two at that time. And, mm-hmm. Hey, I want us to be nationally ranked in two or three years. Everybody thought mm-hmm. of that was a joke, and I thought, okay. I love challenges. I love to be told, no, you can't do something. That seems to motivate me. Um, so it was easy in selling to the athletes, hey, come, let's make a legacy. Let's do something that people think can't be done. Mm-hmm. And just trying to find ways to do that. Um, we did have success and continue to have success. But then I think that kind of, then it was harder to motivate after mm-hmm sustain some success but the uh, whole idea of starting from scratch and building something uh, mm-hmm. really got my juices going and it helped me keep those athletes and you know I, I think it's important as coaches and I, our people business leaders your bosses everybody mm-hmm. um, that we care about who is under us first and if you show them you care about them mm-hmm. they're going to work harder for you exactly and, and you know that you, you've had bosses that you would probably go through a wall for and yeah. others that you have zero motivation to do anything oh for. yes I can tell you right now <laughs> that a certain place a certain gigantic retail corporation I used to work for who shall remain nameless but you kind of you know, yeah I, I made the mistake of working there for five and a half years and you know, yeah, I, I, I shall not go into that. But, um, yeah, I re- was reading through your book. It's very, very cool. And the one thing I, I came back to was, obviously, today's young athletes, high schoolers, college players are different from back when we were in in our younger days, not so long ago, but seemingly so far away. Um <laughs> The challenge is now we you've got we we have a society now where it's a lot of instant gratification. You've got all this technology and all of that, and the the kind of you know because I've got a niece who uh, was an athlete. She played play tennis at R S Central, and um, you know, but also she was one of those that liked to be when she was at home. She would be on her phone or tablet and such. And to me. There is that generational thing, and, and how have you, if you, have you had any issues with that, with having to deal with people that, have, that teenagers and college athletes who were more, I guess you can say they're, they're of a different time, they've got this, where access to inf- instant information, they've got all this em- entertainment, whereas back in the day, we had to basically, you know, we had less of this temptation to goof off than we do now you know Mm -hmm. yes uh, big shift obviously Um, but you'll see the coaches that are still successful have Mm -hmm. kind of evolved with the players yeah Uh, the Matt Browns of the world who Mm -hmm. would think you know a 70 I don't know 76 year old man could tweet and interact on social media um, and try to dance like they dance and I, I think when you do things like that and adapt and it's almost like you're telling the players you'll meet halfway. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do this, now I need this from you. Mm-hmm. And to me, you know, coaches will say, oh, I'm so against social media. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> there, there there are some good things about social media, about, about technology. Mm-hmm. Technology allow, has allowed the game to grow in the mm-hmm. teaching processes. Exactly. So let's embrace the positives. Mm-hmm. And because they're going to be on it. They're going to mm-hmm. use it. So... We need to adapt and figure out how we can best use it for our programs. And, you know, it's kind of today in our our negative climate, divisive climate we have, the Internet's out there to find anything. Oh, yeah. So I would rather challenge athletes to find things on their own and question it. Yeah. You know, when I grew up, you didn't question a coach. And and I don't mean to disrespectfully question a coach now, Mm -hmm. but – challenge coaches with your thoughts okay exactly. why are we doing this and again not disrespectful why but mm-hmm. the more athletes know okay i'm doing this because this mm-hmm. is going to help me da 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 so mm-hmm. I, i'm kind of you know going all over the place with this but it is harder and but yeah. it's especially harder when coaches aren't willing to adapt whether we like it or not technology electronic social media it's all here Oh, yeah. 
let's spend that energy on how we can use it for good Mm -hmm. instead of just looking at it as you know negative and well, and another thing I was looking at, you also um, assist people in all walks of life, not just athletes. That was part on the back of your book, and I was interested to know about things you've done outside of talking to people who are, are motivating athletes and such, because in reading your books, I felt there was a need for these techniques, not just for athletes, but for youth in general. And, uh, you know... A lot of youth today, they get, like we talked about with technology and such, but also, even in our time, we had kids that just didn't have the motivation, they didn't have the parents who were who had the time or the will to really motivate, them, motivate their kids and such, and they didn't necessarily have that internal motivation. How, what have you done outside of the athlete, athletic world to help youth out? That's something I've been kind of interested in. Uh, you know, that's something I'm trying to evolve more and more in. Um, mm-hmm. Just last year, um, I had worked with a, a coach, and she ran uh, some stuff at her school for teachers in general. Mm-hmm. So we kind of took the confident athlete mm-hmm. and put it into academic terms, mm-hmm. and we went in a series of four sessions to teach the teachers of mm-hmm. how to help build the confidence in their students mm-hmm. regardless if they're an athlete or not the same yeah. principles apply my books just kind of gives you know athletic examples mm-hmm. and helping teachers realize because so many of us think confidence is you're either born with it or born without yeah or teachers or coaches or bosses hey be confident well, mm-hmm. what you do there is automatically make that child less confident because mm-hmm. now they're on themselves, well, why don't I feel confident? Mm-hmm. And so what we did was we went in to help the teachers. This is how you can help that student that's mm-hmm. fallen behind or maybe mm-hmm. has behavioral problems because yeah. they feel stupid or they feel in, mm-hmm. insecure. Yeah. Uh, so I'm wanting to explore that more and grow that. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, COVID put a a wrench in that for the time being when the school's being shut down. Mm -hmm. Um, But trying to speak at any, you know, especially during COVID, I have volunteered to speak and talk on podcasts, webinars as much as possible Mm -hmm. and just trying to help, especially youth understand Mm -hmm. that confidence is theirs Mm -hmm. and failure will happen. Mm -hmm. But the most successful people are the ones that respond to that failure. Absolutely. That's one of the things I think in modern society we don't know how to respond to failure. Like we maybe back in the day we used to be able to do it. It seems like with the, with with this instant gratification, instant success, you've got to be good right off. And I'll be honest with you, it's not necessarily a new thing. It's an old thing. Some of us, including myself, would think, you know, if I didn't hit it, get it right off the bat, you know, I'm like, it's not for me and all this. And I, I've, I've had regrets about that. But, um, and one of the things about youth I really think should r- really, most most of the athletic programs today are focused more on, I guess you could say elite athletes or athletes with a lot of potential. And I really would hope that down the road, because one of the things I liked in college was their mural athletics. And I'd love to see that down the road and such and that's one of the things I got from your book is I hope teachers will read this book and motivate kids to do now if, 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 let's say they're not great at an, a sport but they love the sport anyway they're still active at it and still interested in it because today I think a lot of kids who don't get it right off the bat they lose interest in the sport and such right um, and there's so much to gain from it in exactly. addition to the wins and losses. Actually, yeah. more later on down the line. You don't remember the wins and losses as much as you do the experiences and what you learned. That brings me to a very good topic is that uh, a lot of parents these days are very competitive with their kids in sports and such. I'm, I'm sure you've heard stories about parents acting out on youth sports and such, and I'm thinking to oh, myself, I've seen them. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it's like, I know my, my niece played soccer back in high school as well and um, I went to some of her games and especially here um, when she first started out in the Rutherford County Soccer Association it got kind of got a little intense 
with some of the parents. They're not too bad, not as bad as in some places, but it's like, you know, they're supposed to be here to have fun and learn, not necessarily worry so much about winning. What have your experiences been with parents who are maybe a little too much, I guess you'd call it helicopter parenting, where they were yeah, too into their... Helicopter, lawn more, <laughs> yeah. low down. Yeah. Um, you, you know, unfortunately, John, that society in general, not just mm -hmm. the parents of athletes, mm -hmm. um, I'm sure teachers see that in the schools of yeah. trying to go in and, and take care of the grades for their child or oh, yeah. whatever it may be. Um, you, you know, I, I tell coaches when I first start to work, work with a team, 99% of the weaknesses in the athlete comes from either the parent or the coach. Mm -hmm. and, and they're the ones that that need the, this is the way to help my child. Mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, I think too many of them are trying to live vicariously through oh, yeah. uh, their child. You know, others just come from a good place in their heart of honestly mm -hmm. wanting the best for their child. Yeah. Um, but I think it's trying to educate and help parents understand that that's not always the best way to help your child succeed mm -hmm. we need to let them fail mm -hmm. and if if we're always taking care of their problems we're not going to know how to deal with a boss that fires us for no exactly. reason or for unfairness in the workplace mm -hmm. so all of those trials we have on the you know playing time uh, I, I see so many parents complaining about playing time oh, yeah. but it you know it starts with and I mentioned this in the book, we all have to know why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. Why Why is your child playing sports? Why are you a, a sporting parent? Mm -hmm. And be true to that why. You know, very rarely, we all want to play. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I don't want to say that. But rare, very rarely is playing time the number one reason people play. They play because their buddies are playing, mm -hmm. the social aspects, because yeah. they like to compete. They want to be part of something bigger than them mm -hmm. so yeah there's frustration if we're not playing or the coach yells at you but when you remember your why and try mm -hmm. to stay true to that mm -hmm. then that helps you get over the disappointment okay well um i think i'm gonna wrap it up there because it like i said i highly recommend this book not just for athletes but for any youth in general because i wish i had this book back in the day it might have motivated me to do better but it is what it is but I want to thank you, Tammy, for coming on today on my humble little podcast. Um, <laughs> well, thank you, John. I, I look forward to, to hearing it and your other podcast as well. All um, right. Well, I've got your book. I'm getting ready to order it. Oh, you might want to <laughs> strap yourself into that one. That was kind of way. This is, this is, mine's way out there. <laughs> of course, that's not surprising <laughs> for you. Probably, you know me well enough to know I'm kind of out there so all right well i want to thank you so much for joining us today tammy i hope you have a great day and a great rest of your week and for everybody here at rsn uh as we always like to say good night good luck and may the good news be yours